Good morning, Bellevue Growcast. How's everybody doing today? Uh, MJ here with Brother Tim, and we are super excited to be yeah, here. Yeah, and MJ, it might be evening when they're watching this. I mean, so, yeah, you know, true. hey, happy day. Yeah. Good good day to you, sir. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but yeah, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. I know our millions of viewers, you know, like around the world. It's yeah. going to be midnight for somebody. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, it may be tomorrow <laughs> for yeah, them. Well, yeah. it's today for us. Yeah, so, exactly. You know. So, well, awesome. We're glad to have you here. Um, If you've been following along in our Bible reading plan, um, we got some really good stuff this week. Uh, And 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 let me just go ahead and say, too, this may not be a PG version today. A couple mm-hmm. of things that we're going to tackle and look at might be a little more uh, on the verge of PG-13. So you might want to watch without your kids first uh, for some of this. Uh, but uh, we'll try to keep it tame as best we can. Yeah, I know. I listen to I listen to the podcast uh, in in the car a lot. So yeah, if you got your kids, you may just want to. Just wait till later. <laughs> wait till later. Wait till later. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and jump in. Man, jump uh, in so, with the highlight. Yeah, that's right. Jump in the highlight this week. Um, we are uh, kind of in the midst of uh, King David and starting King David. And uh, when we think about the kings of Israel, I mean, the greatest king, right? right. I mean, yeah. uh, aside from King Jesus, but, you know, the greatest completely man king, yeah. no, no god king, Earthly right? God, man king, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so um, in uh, Second Samuel chapter 7, uh, this is where we see uh, the Lord's covenant with David and before we jump into it, like I, I want to talk for a second about what David's gone through, mm-hmm. right? Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, if if you go all the way back to First Chan- First Samuel chapter sixteen, uh, that's when he's anointed as king, right? When the prophet comes and he's like goes through all of Jesse's sons, and he's like, nope, nope, mm-hmm. nope, and they're like, there's nobody left. And he's like, don't you have at least one more son? He's like, well, here's the the smallest and the youngest. Like here he is, yeah. and and the and the prophet's like, yeah. That's the one. Mm. And uh, so he's anointed there, and it takes all the way until Second Samuel chapter 5 mm. uh, before he is uh, – before he's appointed like king, like Saul's gone, and he is now like the king of mm. Israel. Uh, and if, if you go back in chapter 5, it says that he was 30 years old when yeah. he became like king, when he was fully – uh, you know, placed at, on the throne. Yeah, and he was a shepherd boy when he was anointed. So you, right. you're looking at 15 to 20 years, possibly. Yeah, uh, of waiting. Yeah, it's been a long time, and I mean, some crazy stuff has happened already, right? right? Between yeah. uh, him and Saul, between him and Jonathan, uh, between him and Goliath. Like all this stuff has already happened. Yeah, uh, and he's a war hero mm-hmm. at this point, um, and so. You know, the, David comes to this place, and he's he's now king, and uh, this is his prayer of thanksgiving. That's if you've got if you're looking at your Bible, Second um, Samuel uh, chapter seven. The, the most people's Bibles give them a little heading, and that's what it says is David's prayer of thanksgiving. And this is him talking to God, and I really wanted to look at verse eighteen. And verse 22, uh, 18 says this, Then King David went in, he sat in the Lord's presence, and said, Who am I, Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far? Uh, and then down to verse 22, he says, This is why you are great, Lord God. There is none like you, and there is no God besides you, as all we have heard confirms. Mm-hmm. So basically David says, you know, God, who am I? Like, what? what's special about me? That you've brought me and my house, like like my family name, my, my family, like that you've brought us this far, mm. um, and then to go down and said that that there's nobody that's like God, um, and I think we live in a culture so many times today that, I mean, we put so many things up there with God that we put put his importance and all that kind of stuff, but we don't always think of God being the only one like Himself, mm. like we. Um, Especially fight for equality and fairness in our world, and not, that's not wrong. That's a good thing. Yeah. Everybody's equal under God's eyes, and yeah. I don't want to like misconstrue that. Like it, everybody's equal. Jesus loves all of us equally, yeah. but God is holy, and what yeah. He says is right is what's right, and He's the only one who gets to make that judgment, yeah. whether we think it's fair or not. And there are no equal powers. You know, so many people talk yeah. about a higher power, mm-hmm. and they ascribe their thoughts and their ideals of higher powers. But there's only one high power, and that is right. the one true God. And so it is kind of uh, significant because we are all equal in His eyes, mm-hmm. but there is only one God. He is the that's all-powerful, right. only uh, Lord God, Jehovah. So Yeah, and that man, that's what I think is so special about Jesus and so special about Christianity mm-hmm. is that 
you can look at all the other religions and they say, get yourself right and then hope you get into heaven. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, come to me and I'll get you right, yeah, number one. Right. And number two, like you come just as you are. I'll take care of it. Uh, but there's none, none of this, you know, me and Jesus got this worked out. No, he says there's one way, and it's through me, and that's it. Mm. Um, because he's the one that's in control. He's the one that's all powerful. He's the one that wrote the book. I mean, right. he's he's God, and there's none that's like him. David makes it very clear. Um, and and I think sometimes we need to stop and think about, you know, this God that is the God of all creation, the one that created everything. That uh, I say this in youth all the time because like. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I need to hear it, but like it blows my mind when I stand on the beach or I stand on top of a mountain mm-hmm. and I can look and I see everything that God created. Yeah. And I see everything that He made. And that that God that spoke all that into existence wants to have a personal relationship with me. Right. And He loves me enough that He He sent His Son and His Son abandoned everything He had. He put aside His glory, put aside all of it to come here mm-hmm. to die for me. Yeah. And like that God says, I love you. And I doesn't say your life will be easy, doesn't say it'll be perfect, right. but he says, hey, I love you enough that I'll give you an eternal hope, and I'll give you hope while you're here that no matter what you go through, I'll be there. Yeah, and I mean, that's what Brother Jason preached about a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and these, these words are echoed in David's Psalms. You know, what is man that you are mindful of him, that mm-hmm. you've created him a little lower than the angels? Your thoughts of me are more numerous than the sands of the seashore. And it, it is it's so amazing that God, who is sovereign, holy, you know, the one true eternal God, what sometimes we forget is that means he's not on this linear time progression with us. He's on every, uh, he's on the outside of every component of our human history. So he sees it from the beginning, in the middle, and to the end because he's outside of our time and space. Mm-hmm. And so that's why his thoughts are constantly towards us because he sees every component of our life. And that God desires a relationship with us, knowing everything he knows about our life on that timeline. He loves us and desires a relationship with us. And, I mean, what what is man that he is mindful of us? You know, it's, sure. it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were times that David was like, why in the world, like, will this not relent? But, mm. like, God knew better than he did. Yeah. And God knows better than we do. And um, it's funny. We, we get to the end a lot of times and we look back on things that we've gone through. And we're like, oh, that's why God let us go through that. Or, wow, I really am super blessed when mm. I didn't think I was blessed in that situation. Uh, when the whole time God knew we would be blessed, and He knew He was actively blessing us, even though we didn't see it. Right. So, man, He He's just good, and like this, just this part of what of David's Thanksgiving, I think, is something that needs to that we need to remember that God has brought us really far, yeah. whether we feel like it's far yeah. in the moment or not. He yeah. has brought us far, mm-hmm. and He's mindful. He didn't have to be. We we actively spit in His face, mm. and He still loves us. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's that's the essence of the gospel, right? Romans 5, mm-hmm. 8, we were still sinners and he died for us anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing more beautiful every, than that. Every day we make mistakes that he could just wipe us out for. Right. He could just zap us. You know, mm-hmm. that we've been making those kind of mistakes all of our lives that he could have said, oh, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but he he is mindful of us. He is loving. He is gracious. He is merciful and kind and long-suffering. He doesn't yeah. want us to, you know, pay the consequences for our sin. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you. I think you got the rest. I'm gonna just sit back. Well, no, you got to you got to pitch in because again, it's gonna get a little bit uh, personal um, here. Uh, David, as as we think about him, a man after God's own heart. Um, in fact, uh, a couple of chapters after uh, MJ's um, text in chapter nine, we we just see David's character and integrity. Uh, we see that he truly was a, a genuinely man who was pursuing God. But there came a time in his life where he began to pursue his flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, many of you are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, and in that story, uh, David gives in to his the lust of the flesh. He gives in to the temptation. Uh, he has an adulterous relationship with mm-hmm. Bathsheba and then has her uh, ends up having her husband Uriah murdered. And the prophet Nathan uh, tells David that as a result of that sin, um, that David would would essentially lose four lambs. He and he was giving a symbolism and prophecy that David would have a house full of of chaos and um, all kinds of consequences that came from uh, that sin. 
And so the first one, of course, uh, that, that falls is David's uh, firstborn child with Bathsheba. Uh, it dies after eight days. Uh, but uh, very close in proximity to that in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13, we come to a story that's very dark. Uh, that's why I'm utilizing it as a shadow. Um, it's a very dark story. Um, two of David's children by different wives, uh, Tamar, a daughter, and Amon, a son. Um, Amon, uh, David's son, desires and, and, and has uh, a lust for his sister, Tamar. Um, it says that he was infatuated with her. In fact, when uh, his friend asked him what's wrong, why he's so bothered, he says, I love her so much. So he actually confesses that he has a love for her. Um, and But in that love, his desire is to have her sexually. Uh, his desire is to have her in an inappropriate way. Uh, you know, of course, it's inappropriate for, um, for, for children of the same parents to have you know, that kind of relationship. And we think about that, and we think that's gross, and we think that that's wrong. Um, in, in biblical times, with the number of wives that some of these men have, um, it wasn't quite as taboo, but there was still the need for there to be the proper marriage ceremony and the proper giving away of a daughter. Um, but um, Amon is not willing to wait. He, he mm-hmm. desires her. Uh, he is actually lusting after her. It's not real love that we see here. This is a desire of the flesh. It's a desire of lust. And so his friend convinces him to uh, come up with a story, to come up with a scheme, to get her in close proximity to Amon so that he can have his way with her. And so one of the things, one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, talk about this story, uh, as dark as it is, is because we all need to be on guard against toxic relationships, against relationships that are not good for us. There are people in your life that love you, and there are people in your life that lust after you. Um, and that comes in lots of forms. It's not just sexually speaking. This story mm-hmm. is graphic. It, it, it's, it's a, it has a sexual nature to it. It has a rape element to it. But it's also a warning to all of us that there are dangerous relationships that exist around us. And if we're not careful, we will fall prey to them. Because Amon didn't really love Tamar. He lusted after her. Mm-hmm. And so here, here's one of the things that I want us to see. If someone lusts after you, then they will confuse you. Uh, he, he comes up with this story. I'm sick. I don't feel good. The only person I want in the room to help me is my sister Tamar. There should have been red flags going off for David. You know, there, there, I think there were actually red flags going off for Tamar because when she brings in the food, she sets it before him and then steps away to let him eat. Um, like, okay, I've done what you've asked. I'm here. Go ahead and eat. But then... Amon clears the room. He says, I want everybody else to leave. Mm -hmm. And he says, "Uh, Tamar, I want you to feed me. So I know most likely there are alarm bells going off for her. Um, But when the situation presented itself where he was alone with her, he overpowered her because he was stronger and he raped her. He confused her. I have a problem. I need your help. Only you can help me with this problem. And that's what someone who who is only after manipulating you or getting something from you, uh, and that they're going to try to confuse you to make you uncertain and not sure what's going on. But, well, of your good nature, sure, I'll help out. Because once they confuse you and you give them what they want or, or pr- the, the opportunity presents itself, they're going to use you and abuse you. Mm-hmm. And that's what... Amon does. He uses an abuser. He rapes her. Um, we need to realize that there are true victims. Um, sometimes we get frustrated in our culture because everybody's a victim. There are true victims. Th- this stuff really does happen, and it is it is abhorrent. It is sad, um, and and a lot of times it just it makes you uh, sick to your stomach to think about. But. Amon uh, uses and abuses her. And and then listen to what the the passage says after that. It it says this in verse um, 15. After this, Amon hated Tamar with such intensity that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love that he had had for her. And he said to her, get out of here. And she said to him, sending me away is going to be much worse. Um, did you ever see the the movie Airplane? It might have been Airplane Two. Do you remember? Do you remember the scene where the lady won't stop screaming, and so mm-hmm. everybody takes turns slapping her, and then they go down the aisle of the plane, and yeah. everybody's waiting to hit, hit her or beat her with something, you know, clubs, bats, golf clubs. Yeah. Um, I would get in that line. 
uh, for Eamon. I, I would get in that line. I'm sorry. I just the human nature. I, yeah. This makes me sick to think about sure. someone a using, abusing, manipulating, and then refusing them, kicking them out, and saying, "I don't need you anymore. I've gotten what I want from you. Mm-hmm. So get out of here." This was this was a terrible atrocity for a woman in the Old Testament for for her to lose her virginity and lose her purity. Um, it was it was a terrible disgrace. And so she was going to live with that disgrace the rest of her life, and he didn't care. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I want to encourage uh, – I, I know this is dark, but I want it to be an encouragement. There, You have money and resources. You have um, what people would recognize as an allegiance. You represent something to people. They, they want what you have. They are jealous for what you have, and it may be your money. And it may be that you'll click on their video and like their video and be a follower of theirs or whatever the case might be. It might be capitalistic and they've got a product and they know the product's not any good, but they happen to know how to market it and advertise it and you spend your money on it. And people who are in this kind of um, mindset, they don't care about us. They don't love us. They want our money. They want our resources. They want our attention. They want our allegiance. And once we give it to them, they could care less about us. Yeah. Now, there's probably some good people out there that'll sign some fans' autographs and that kind of stuff. There's some good companies out there. They'll make good on their warranties and all. But at the end of the day, they're after what they can get from us. Sure. That is not real love. Love is sacrificing yourself for someone. Mm-hmm. You think about Jesus. Jesus wanted the very best for us. Like you were talking about, God desires a relationship with us. But the way that he went about getting that was not tricking us or conniving or being deceptive. He said, I'm going to show you how much I desire a relationship with you. I'm going to sacrifice myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what love really looks like. People who love you are willing to sacrifice themselves. They're willing to be patient. They're willing to wait. And they don't demand anything from you. If you're in a relationship where people are demanding something from you, it's a toxic relationship. They're just trying to get something out of you. Mm-hmm. We need to be looking for those godlike relationships where people truly care about us and love us. You think about your spouse. You think about your parents. You, you think about that dear Christian friend. There are good, godly people who love you, and they will never demand anything from you. They will seek to be sacrificial and selfless in their relationship with you. So I just kind of wanted to give a warning. This is a, a dark story, but I just kind of wanted to give a warning that we need to be on guard because this happens all around us, and it's not just sexual in nature that people are victims. Right. Yeah, and and I was sitting here thinking about, uh, or sit earlier thinking about it, and then while you were sitting there talking, you know, to to be in her shoes would be almost unimaginable, right? It, especially with the culture that she lived in, and now she feels especially worthless, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I tell the youth this all the time, but uh, th- this is for you, whoever's mm-hmm. watching. This is for all of us. Mm-hmm. If anybody's ever made you feel worthless or made you feel like you're not worth anything, like, I mean, he absolutely made her feel that way when he said, "I don't even want to have anything to do with you." Yeah. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Jesus thought you were worth something. That's right. Uh, if, if it was just you that he had to die for, he's, he would have done it. Because when he went to that cross or when, or when he was in that garden and he looks in the cup, right, he sees our sin, mm. and he, he knew it up front. Mm. He knew what he was going into. And if he, nobody's ever told you, you're worth something to Jesus yeah. because he came and died for you. Um, and I know especially women you know, seem to struggle with that more than men do. Mm-hmm. Um, but even in like the community where I grew up in this past weekend, um, you know, because this comes out like a week after we mm. do it. You know, this past weekend there was a, a young man who lost his battle with depression and, mm. and committed suicide. And I know that community's rocked right now. And, um, you know, I don't know all the details, but we live in a culture that says if you don't think that everything's okay, then you're worthless and you're all this stuff. You're not. Yeah. Jesus loves you. Yeah. And he died for you. And he died to to give you hope and um just know today, if, if anybody's watching this and you don't know, if you don't get anything else from this, like yeah. you're worth something yeah. to Jesus because yeah. he loves you that much. Yeah. And, and you know, for Tamar, you know, there's no doubt she was probably just trying to do her responsibility and her duty to family. She was innocent in yeah. this. 
Um, one of the things, just to piggyback off what you're saying, is is that's why it's so important that you find your identity in Christ, mm-hmm. because there's something within us that is desperate for acceptance. There's something sure. desperate within us that says, "I need people to pay attention to me and make me feel important." And again, that's why it's so important to have this relationship with God through Son Jesus, because when you're when you find your identity in Him, you don't really need anything of else from anybody else. I mean, right. you you you, ha- you want a marriage partner, fine. You want children, fine. You've got parents, that's great. But when you, at the end of the day, if you have that relationship with Christ, you don't need anybody else's affirmation. Uh, it's nice to get, right? It's nice to get pats on the back. But when God tells you, hey, you, you're enough. Yeah. I, I've given you all that you need. Um, there's encouragement there to know I don't got to try to please anybody else, and I don't got to try to get anything from anybody else because God has given me everything I need in giving me His Son Jesus Christ and giving me His love. Yeah. What What's What's greater than the Creator of the universe giving yeah. you that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That nobody else is going to measure up. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's good. That's good. Um, so uh, we're going to turn away from kind of this dark shadow. Uh, and I want to talk about um, something that is it, it is somewhat of a sensitive topic for a lot of people, a personal topic. But if uh, if you've been reading with us and we're we're in the Proverbs right now, um, Proverbs chapter five, Proverbs chapter six, uh, some of my favorite conversations. I, I want people to be uh, healthy families. I want mm-hmm. I want moms and dads to be healthy parents. I want husbands and wives to be healthy spouses. I want us to have healthy family units. It's just, I think that if we will follow God's wisdom, then those things can exist. And in the Proverbs, we get God's wisdom. I mean, it's coming from a father to a son for the most part. Uh, but, you know, I see it as our Heavenly Father mm-hmm. giving His children the wisdom for living. And um, so the two topics that um, uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6 deal with are two of the topics that rock and, and, and destroy most marriages, mm-hmm. um, and that is sex and money. Uh, two things that are personal, two things we don't like to talk about. Hey, it's my business. But when the divorce rate among Christians is similar to the divorce rate among non-believers and worldly marriages, then there's a problem. We, we got to stop thinking that this stuff is taboo and we can't talk about it and, mm-hmm. you know, just let each husband and wife, you know, deal with it at home. No doubt, that's where it starts. Husbands yeah. and wives have got to figure it out. They've got to get together. They've got to get on the same page. But sometimes they don't want the preacher to talk about it. They don't want on the podcast to talk about sex and marriage, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but we've got to stop making it taboo because it's too important. God gives us lots of wisdom yeah. on both of those topics in the Scripture. Um, the beginning of chapter 5, actually, um, the, the writer is encouraging his son to stay away from seduction and to stay away from the, the pursuits of lust and the worldly uh, pursuits that come in that kind of lifestyle. And, and he says in uh, verses 11 and 12, he says this, he says the, the consequences, at the end of your life you will lament when your physical body has been consumed and you will say how I hated discipline and how my heart despised correction. Um, I think we've got to get away from our pride in our marriages. We need God's wisdom. We need God's correction. We need um, that that knowledge that only comes from Him to be able to have those healthy homes that God desires for us to have. And so when you get down here into verse 5 and uh, the end of chapter 5 and the the beginning of chapter 6, you you first uh, are dealing with the, the sexual intimate relationship. Uh, he talks about enjoying your marriage, enjoying that relationship that God has given you. Um, and and so when you think about it, right, what is marriage? Marriage is a covenant. It is a commitment in which you are indebted to the other person as long as you both shall live. Sure. Now, it's pretty sobering, but at the same time, isn't that why we should not enter marriage lightly? Mm-hmm. You you are indebting yourself to that other person, and they are indebting themselves to you. And so um, marriage should be taken seriously. We should not enter to it lightly because you have exclusively said, I'm committing myself to this person for the rest of my life. Financially, on the other hand, the Bible talks about the need for us to be careful not to get in debt to other people. Uh, a friend, a neighbor, a corporation. 
And we can talk all day about good debt versus bad debt, and that's you know that's a that's a, a podcast for another day. <laughs> um, you know, there is good debt, there is bad debt, uh, but the scripture says, "Don't be indebted to your fellow man." Why? It's it's a trap, it's a snare, it's an entanglement, and you may never get yourself out of it because you right. sink yourself into such deep debt. And so these two topics, when you think about the way that we handle these two issues, verses 15 through 19 says, you should enjoy your spouse. You should enjoy. There's a lot of, uh, if you're, if you're uh, into imagery and symbolism, you go read the book of Song of Solomon. There's a lot of um, sexual imagery. The same thing happens here in Proverbs chapter 5. There is imagery. There, he's saying you are to enjoy each other uh, and that if this is for nobody else. That This is not something that anybody else should be a part of. This is you personally with your spouse, but it should be enjoyment. I, I've told couples, you know, I, I believe that the, the intimacy and the sex of marriage should be uh, like the playground of our marriage. It should be the amusement park of our marriage. We should have fun there. We should enjoy it. And the sad reality is most of the time, Christians want the kind of sex they see the world having when the reality is the world should desire this, the kind of sex and intimacy that we have um, in our marriages as Christians. And it's reversed. And we know that there's lots of culprits, uh, internet and movies and entertainment and commercials. Um, and so we, we need to be careful to remember that Paul tells us a couple of things. Paul says, your body is no longer your own. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't like that uh, in our world. We're like, well, hey, wait a minute, man. We're all about individuality, and I'm me, and you're you, and you keep your hands off of. Uh, but he says our bodies are not our own. They belong to our spouse now. And he also says that we ought not deprive our, each other in this area. This is one of those areas we ought not deprive. Why? Because if we deprive, what enters? Temptation. Temptation sure. is going to enter if we deprive ourselves. And so now, I want to encourage you, you should still date. I don't care how long you've been married, you should right. still date. You have got to get someone to watch the kids, and you go out and enjoy a night with your spouse. You've got to date. You've got to flirt. Don't be afraid to flirt. Uh, I know sometimes, depending, one partner thinks, well, if I flirt, I know where that's going to lead, and I don't really <laughs> want it to lead there. We need to be able to still flirt. Date and flirt. We need to study our spouse. Just because you get married don't mean you stop studying them. When you're right. dating, you're studying all the time so you can figure out how can I woo them more to, to, you know, to decide to marry me. Yeah. And then we get married and we stop studying them. <laughs> Yeah. We should know them. We should yeah. study them. Um, we should speak their love language. Uh, you know, I know that there's a book on love languages, and it, it might not be exactly uh, the way that that book puts it, but everybody does have a love language, the way they enjoy being loved. You should speak your spouse's love language and, and, and vice versa. There should be a reciprocation there that each of you speak the love language that your spouse wants to hear. Um, demonstrate passion. I mean, I, again, I know it's kind of like, ah, but I'm tired and I'm worn out and I don't want to be passionate. Let them know that you still desire them. Let them know sure. that there's still a passion that burns within you. But I, I, I've said still, 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 still do all these things. Never abuse the gift. Mm -hmm. Never abuse it. That, that's kind of one of the things that we have to be careful of. We, when, we start, when we stop dating, when we stop communicating, when we stop being intimate on all the other levels and we just want sex, that's an abuse of that gift that God has given. Right. All those other things go into making a wonderful, healthy sexual experience for both the husband and the wife. Um, so I, I wanted to use some, um, some uh, traditional imagery. Let's just say um, that Haley says, uh, hey, MJ, I'm tired today. Um, I don't really want to cook, so pick up some dinner on the way home. That that'd be acceptable. You could stop sure. by any restaurant you wanted to and get some dinner. Uh, I might this Saturday. I might go. You know, it's been a hard week. It's been a long week. I, I'm tired. Uh, my leg hurts from running. I think I'm going to hire out a lawn service to cut the grass and manicure the lawn. Right. That's acceptable. That 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 is an acceptable solution. That's an acceptable substitute. And in a lot of areas of life, you can do that. Yeah. You can find a substitute and a solution. But you cannot do that in intimacy. Mm. You cannot do that in the sexual relationship. You can never say, find another solution. So even when we're tired and even when it's difficult and even when it's been a long week, our spouse still needs that, sure. um, that intimacy and that love. And so uh, I, I want to encourage, go back and read this portion of the Proverbs 
understand that God desires for us to have healthy intimacy. It's not always going to lead to sex, yeah. but that is a byproduct of what a healthy, intimate marriage looks like, is that we can enjoy the, the wife, the spouse of our youth that God has given. Um, yeah. I know I've talked a lot of it. Do you, do you want to jump in <laughs> yeah, on any I, of that? I was going to say, I, I was glad you kind of threw that last part in there about uh, that sex isn't always the intimacy part, and especially... For guys, that's what guys think about with intimacy yeah. most of the time. And, yeah. uh, it's not for women most of the time. And yeah. so, uh, like you said, if you don't show that your wife or that you're passionate, then you, they're not going to want to do that. And yeah. that's, it goes both ways. You know, yeah. uh, we, we talked a little bit about, not this subject, but we talked <laughs> a, a little bit last night about uh, in youth about, you know, it, it's not our life anymore. Like we have to die to ourselves yeah. and now Christ is alive in yeah. us. And, we have to think about our marriage in the same way. Like I mean, that's what Paul tells us to mm-hmm. treat it like Jesus would treat us. That's that we're right. I mean, giving ourselves up completely yeah. uh, to to love the other person, and that's the beautiful thing about Christianity as a whole. But yeah. also our marriages. If I'm completely denying myself and worrying about my wife, and yeah. she's doing the same thing, exactly. then she's got my back, and I've got her back, and we don't have to worry about 100%. it. A hundred percent. So I, 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 I share that often. If both partners are striving to give a hundred percent of meeting the needs of their spouse, there's never not going to be a time that our needs are being met by the person right. that they're supposed to be met by yeah. uh, in that spouse. And so that that's the way that we treat the intimacy often, but this is the way God's Word tells us that we should. And, and on, on the other hand, in regards to the financial part of it, uh, it's something, right? We we are just willy-nilly about throwing ourselves into debt. Mm. It, 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 you know, these relationships that are not good for us and not healthy for us, we find ourselves jumping into them very easily. Uh, we're trying to keep up with the world. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Mm-hmm. We want a nicer house. We want a different car. We want, you know, we want the kids to have the best clothes. We want them to go to the finest schools, and on and on and on. And we find ourselves just swamped in debt. Sure. And 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 part and this is, you know, I think this is part of the reason that sometimes the intimacy at home is so difficult is because debt is a man. It's a it's an intimacy killer. No, because yeah. you're constantly thinking, how am I going to get out of debt? How am I going to get out of debt? And there's so much freedom in marriage, and yet we ignore it. And there's so much uh, restraint in debt, yet we dive into it. Sure. I think as we think about these two topics, we need to strive to embrace our spouse and ignore the world. We need to pay off those credit cards. We need to pay down that debt. We, we need to make wiser choices and decisions so that our home can be healthier. Uh, Danette and I, we don't have a lot of bad debt. Um, we we um, we typically keep the, the the healthy debt. We have a house debt. We have no credit card debt, and we try to keep one or zero car loans <laughs> going at any point. Yeah. Um, so we're not in terrible debt. But still, the financial issues are a daily grind, and we find ourselves anxious and upset and butting heads, and and that just destroys the intimacy when you're constantly worried about how we're going to pay this mm-hmm. off or how we're going to do this. And so, I think it's wise for us to say, "All right, let me deal with the debt and let me get it knocked out." And go see Dave Ramsey on that; he's an expert, <laughs> and I'm not right. But deal with that, get it taken care of, get it out of the system. Um, and begin to realize, I want to embrace the person I've indebted myself to for life, my spouse, Mm -hmm. and I want to ignore what the world is trying to throw at me. Again, when you go back to the story of uh, Amon and Tamar, the worldly influences, they don't love you. They're trying to milk you for everything that they can get, and they will leave you high and dry when they get it. Um, Your spouse should be that person that loves you, wants the best for you, and is willing to sacrifice for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, especially talking about not taking marriage lightly, you know, you're always going to have different points of view about Mm -hmm. everything in marriage. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm one of those people that, like, I could go buy a camper and live in a camper. I just, like, I'm simple. (laughs) Uh, Like, like, I don't even have – I don't even carry a wallet. I put my – my debit card and stuff in a, fo- a wallet on my phone because I'm like I don't want to have that much stuff in my pockets. Yeah. Like I'm just that kind of person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 
Haley is like, no, we're not living in a camper, <laughs> right? And like, so we're different, and that's not bad. It probably wouldn't be good to live in a camper. Let's just let me just throw that out there. Like, it wouldn't work, especially with two crazy children, right? <laughs> Would not work for us. Uh, but I say all that to say, like, we have different things that we think would be the best thing, and in in that aspect of marriage, especially when you talk about money, like. You have to compromise. Yeah. You have to wise decisions, wise but decision, yeah. you don't always get everything that you want. That's right. And yeah. you, sometimes yeah. you have to say, okay, well, my 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 spouse wants this, and I don't necessarily want it. But if it's not a bad decision, but it's something they want, then mm. that, that's what we have to work towards. Yeah. Um, and making making those things like common goals that you're going to work towards together. Um, I mean, I'll use one example. I hate to paint. Mm. Can't stand to paint. I'm really bad at painting. Uh, I'm going to call Brother Phil. Phil Gaston. Yeah, I was about to say, was, that's who I'm calling because Ms. that's all Miss Debbie talks about, actually, is that he paints all the time and he's really good at it. And, uh, like, I can't stand it, but Haley loves to paint. Yeah. Like, I say loves to paint. Loves to have things painted. Let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, and she doesn't let me do it anymore because I'm really bad at it. Uh, but, like, I would just never paint. But it's it's something that she likes. And so we have to compromise on those things. and. You know, it's not bad to paint. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And, and I think that hits on a good point about financial wisdom. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, everything belongs to both of you. Uh, yeah. So you do have to be in agreement. You do have to compromise. And so that means you got to communicate about it. You don't just you don't just go spend willy nilly. You don't just go spend mm-hmm. without talking to the other. You include them in that. You listen to their side of um, of how they view it. Uh, yeah. I've not always been good at that. It's one of the you know one of the things I know that I struggle with is I don't always. I don't always do a good job of listening to Danette's perspective on finances or whatever. Uh, and so it's wise to listen and to talk and to compromise and to mm-hmm. be in agreement on uh, when you are talking about those financial things. Because you're going to have to spend some money at times that you don't sure. want to spend. Yeah. Uh, but it's just reality. It's the, the world in which we live in. So right. you just want to do it with wisdom. Yeah. I mean, we've all been brought up with different perspectives and different mm-hmm. situations. And it may be a situation you think you know a lot about that necessarily you don't know. Yeah. And or you're not thinking clearly through. And, um, you know, we just got to do a good job. Yeah. Everybody like it. like I'm the spender. Daynet's the saver. What about you guys? Uh, if you ask Haley, I literally don't spend any money on myself like she's like i'll spend money on everybody else like i'll spend money on her and the kids that doesn't bother me but like she's like why don't you go buy some new socks i'm like ah they only have three <laughs> holes in them you know they're good like i just don't it, <laughs> it's probably a bad thing for me you know but yeah i mean that's just how i am yeah. so yeah. that's funny that's <laughs> yeah. funny that's good um, well, man, it's been it's been a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully, we didn't offend too many people. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. With these uh, <laughs> shadows and applications of our of our time together, I pray that it's been encouraging and uplifting. Yeah. Um, even though it's been personal and sensitive, uh, we need this wisdom. It comes from God, and we yeah. need that. That's uh, right. So, man, it's been great to see you. Thanks for joining in. For MJ, I'm Tim, and uh, we don't know who will be here next week, but we're looking forward uh, to another podcast next week, yeah. and hope you'll join us then. Have a great week. See you.